Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. In about one month's time, the Israeli government would be able to start the process of extending its sovereignty to parts of the disputed territories east of its internationally recognized borders and west of the Jordan River. This move should be coordinated with the U.S. administration and has already raised strong objections by the Jordanian and Palestinian leaderships as well as by domestic critics. Is this effort to annex disputed areas practical and wise to explore the issue. We are joined from another location in Jerusalem by Professor Ephraim Inbao, the president of the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security. Welcome. Hi. Also joining our panel from Central Israel is Colonel in Reserve Reuven Ben Shalom, who is a cross cultural strategist and associate at the International Institute for Counterterrorism at the IDC in Herzliya. Welcome. Hi. And joining me here at the studio is our TV7 analyst, Mr. Amir Oren, and I would like to immediately also dive into this topic. Mr. Oren, give us a broader understanding of this uh, specific topic. So uh, what do we talk about when we talk about annexation? 53 years ago uh, this week, the Israeli Defense Forces captured uh, certain territories, uh, as you said, uh, east of uh, Israel's border from the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. But these territories were not a sovereign part of uh, Jordan, because uh, even though King Abdallah I of Jordan uh, annexed uh, these territories uh, uh, right after the 1948 war, almost no one in the world recognized it. So it was a unilateral move. Israel uh, captured the territories, but their status waited until it will be finally resolved in uh, negotiations between Israel and the Arabs. Lo and behold, 53 years have elapsed and nothing concrete, nothing permanent has been uh, settled. Yes, in the Oslo Accords, the Palestinian Authority was established in the negotiations between Israel and the Palestinian Liberation Organization, but these negotiations also stalled. Now comes President Trump, uh, who is uh, an ardent supporter of uh, the current uh, government of Israel's program, and says that he is going to allow the Netanyahu government to extend the sovereignty of the state of Israel over certain parts of the occupied and disputed territories, provided that there will also be a Palestinian state that will be established after four years of negotiations, and that there will be a swap in which some territories right now under the control and sovereignty of Israel would be given to this uh, uh, Palestinian state which is not yet uh, in existence, and Israel could extend its sovereignty to the Jordan Valley and to other areas in which there are Jewish settlements. I would like to ask you, Professor Inbal, with regard to uh, what Mr. Owen just stated, uh, the situation is very complex. Of course, uh, the Arab dissidents that are living currently in uh, the territories that are defined as the West Bank, which includes, of course, the Jordan Valley and the biblical districts of Judea and Samaria, have adopted their uh, so-called historic uh, titles uh, of uh, what was before the state of Israel was uh, established, Palestinians under British mandated Palestine, uh, even though at the time they kind of rejected uh, this uh, definition. But I, I would like to ask you specifically, why now, why after 53 years since Israel was able to uh, uh, take over those territories and has debated the question of annexation, of asserting Jerusalem sovereignty over those territories for many, many years and refused to do so quite uh, uh, incessantly for that matter. Why now is the situation in which they say, okay, this is the time to do so, even though there is still pretty much the same object uh, objection that was several years back? Well, I think that uh, the situation is entirely different. Now the Americans are uh, uh, backing uh, Israeli uh, applying their law to parts of Judea and Samaria. It is part of a peace uh, plan. Uh, it is uh, uh, 
done in coordination with the U.S., the strongest uh, power uh, in the world now. And I think that uh, Israel would like to capitalize on this uh, occasion uh, to emphasize that there are certain areas that are very important to its uh, security, uh, like the Golan Heights. We did annex the Golan Heights. We also expanded uh, Jerusalem uh, already in 67, signaling to the world that uh, those areas are not really for grabs in any future negotiations. Indeed, uh, Colonel Ben Shalom, how do you perceive this? Of course, uh, we hear conflicting uh, uh, statements about the strategic uh, uh, significance of uh, the Jordan Valley in particular, of course, Judea and Samaria as well. On the one hand, concerned over uh, reactions from Jordan, which is a strategic partner of the state of Israel, while on the other hand, there is an issue of depth of, uh, of field for, for defensive uh, purposes, uh, regardless of the coordination with uh, the Jordanian authorities? I think we have to completely separate between Israel's interests or vital strategic needs and the current political moves uh, done by Israel, this government, and the Trump administration. As far as strategic necessity, I think there's no question that the Jordan Valley is critical for Israel's defense. It's almost like discussing the Golan Heights. That's not a matter of emotions or being attached to a place historically. It's a matter of, of holding the place where if you do not seize it, you open yourself up to trouble, you're vulnerable, you have no strategic depth. So I think we need the Jordan, the Jordan Valley. But that has nothing to do with the current timing and the way it is done, that's a completely separate issue. Remember that in Israel, we lack a defined strategy. If we all knew what our government plans to do in the long run and how this gov the, the government plans to achieve it and what milestones, maybe then we could know how it fits in. Certainly now it's utilizing the fact that we feel that we have a very supportive administration in Washington that almost enables anything we want. So I think that's the timing, but, and we can discuss this later, I don't, I don't think we're looking out for the dangers of the current timing and, of course, the political aspects of this and how it could ignite uh, a cascade of events in the Middle East. Indeed, a significant but. Mr. Oren, when we're talking about uh, uh, moving on uh, annexation, the Israeli authorities are, of course, very eager of doing something like this at this moment, but at the same time, the Americans are very relaxed, very laid back, saying very clearly it's not only the 30% that you're allowed in the so-called deal of the century, but we're talking also right now about accepting the 100%. Well, on the one hand, we have uh, Benny Gantz, the alternate prime minister and defense minister, saying we will accept all of the American proposal. Netanyahu is not very eager to move ahead on accepting all of it because of also his own political bloc, which is very reluctant of accepting significant parts, including a Palestinian state, which uh, Netanyahu himself says, as long as he is prime minister, this will never come to pass. So Netanyahu has been in office for 14 years now, three years in the 1990s and uh, 11 consecutive years. And uh, he has almost nothing to show for it as far as legacy is concerned. Um, if he were to resign from office today and his supporters were to look back and ask themselves, so what permanent um, assets did he leave us? The answer would be almost nothing. Day to day, uh, things may have been fine between wars and campaigns, but th there is nothing permanent uh, to give him credit for. So he wants to have... Even when we're talking about American recognition of Jerusalem, the moving from the embassy of Tel uh, from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, uh, the recognition of the Golan Heights by the United States, a lot of things that Netanyahu has claimed credit for, for his uh, close ties with uh, U.S. President Donald Trump, which is quite apparent. So the operative word in what you said is American. And one cannot equate the United States of America with the world. Yes, of course, as Ephraim Inbar said, the United States is, of course, the most important power on earth. But nevertheless, if you want global recognition, if you want it in the United Nations, then 
as the song says, will take Manhattan, that is the UN headquarters, and then the world. So we, we have taken Washington, but we have not taken Manhattan. And uh, as far as it goes, the American recognition of really West Jerusalem, it is not um, the entire city of Jerusalem because President Trump has left open the question of what will be the status of East Jerusalem, which perhaps in some form could be the capital of the uh, Palestinian state. But leaving that aside, the question uh, in the Middle East is uh, how can you separate the territory from the people, the inhabitants? And of course you cannot. Everybody would have liked to have more areas, more terrain, but less people to be counted in the population and if given full rights to vote uh, in its democracy. So the Jordanians too have a two-state problem. The Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, which is right now only on the East Bank, only as the original Transjordan, does not really want the West Bank to come back under its uh, sovereignty. Uh, you, they know that they will, it will be very problematic. There will be an underground terror. And you know, only recently, the Central Intelligence Agency has um, uncovered a document from the late 1950s, 1958, where the Jordanian prime minister said to an American diplomat, you know, if there are problems and King Hussein's regime is in trouble, we would rather that Prime Minister Ben-Gurion take care of the West Bank and of the Palestinians. They were willing to give Israel at the time the West Bank so as not to have to take care of the Palestinians. So one has to find a solution whereby everybody would be satisfied with some uh, limited sort of sovereignty over some of the territories, perhaps some sort of a confederation, again, a swap. It could not be a unilateral annexation of territories, which the other parties would resist and fight. Indeed. Professor Inbar, your take on this? Well, I really uh, wonder at my colleagues. It's uh, Washington, uh, our best, strongest, most important ally, is proposing a peace uh, program. A peace uh, negotiations with the Palestinians. Uh, should we say no? Uh, I think that Israel should accept all components of the uh, Trump uh, peace uh, plan, uh, including, of course, uh, uh, annexing those areas which are extremely important to us. And actually, Trump also uh, suggests, according to the plan, suggests that Israel will rule all over Jerusalem, including East Jerusalem. We cannot say no to such an offer. Nevertheless, and uh, at the same time, of course, negotiate with the Palestinians. Uh, a Palestinian state? When we're talking specifically about Jerusalem, the, the Trump uh, uh, peace plan, the initiative itself, states very clearly that Jordan's role on the Temple Mount, uh, the uh, Haram and Sharif, will be not uh, changed, the status quo will uh, remain the same, and this in effect means that Jer not all of Jerusalem will be part of Israel. The specific part where uh, most Jews see as the most uh, revered and holy place within the Jewish religion will remain under the Waqf and under the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. I am not uh, perfectly satisfied with the status quo on the Mount, uh, on the Temple Mount, but at the same time, we should remember that the Waqf, the Jordanian Waqf, not the Palestinian Waqf, is. Uh, in charge or administratively of uh, of that of the mountain, uh, but uh, the Israeli police is at the gates, and the Israeli police decides after all who gets in and who gets out. So uh, this is not uh, a perfect solution, uh, as far as I'm concerned. But uh, this definitely takes care of uh, Jordanian interests. And again, I'm I don't understand why my colleagues are objecting. Uh, to get uh, the approval of uh, the United States to our uh, united Jerusalem. Well, we have enough time to ask uh, our distinguished co uh, colleagues about this question. Colonel Ben Shalom, uh, what is the reason? 
Well, for, first, I disagree with a, with a, what seems like the foundation of this discussion, as if annexation is part of the Trump deal. And since they gave it to us on a platter, what, we're going to say no? I, I don't buy it. I think that the whole discussion on annexation in relation to the deal was very embarrassing. The deal was presented. Of course, it's not a deal. It was a one uni, unilateral thing, you know, uh, constructed by the United States in collaboration with Israel. Uh, of course, as expected, the Palestinian uh, didn't accept it. But the whole idea of the deal was that now we will go to the negotiation table and the Israelis and Palestinians together will will reach a deal. And of course, the outline was given, uh, not really a Palestinian state, but an entity controlled from all over. And of course, something that probably most Israelis could live with. The question is if Palestinians could live with this. And then the Israelis came out with this annexation thing, embarrassed the Americans while they were still in Washington. And then I, I don't even, I don't, I'm not sure I understand it all until now, but there was this whole debate on, wait, was it a part of it? How was it a part of it? What do they mean by annexation? How much percent? Is it now? Is it later? And then this idea of the joint mapping committee came up. I got to tell you, I don't even, I'm not even sure it was part of the original deal. Maybe it was brought up later in order to, to fix the situation that, would always, that already was unraveling. But right now we have a situation where everybody feels like, that's it. We got annexation. Yay, we won. We stuck it to the Palestinians. We got the territory. I think that's not the situation. I think our basic terminology is even wrong. And so I, th I, don't, th I don't even think it's, it's a debate if we need it or not, or if we should someday annex it and how, but it's just like running with it, enjoying like our, our so-called victory, just as Israelis like to do, seeing the short term and not the long term. And remember, I didn't even say my opinion on should we someday in some form or other uh, annex a certain part of the territory. The question is how to do it, how to do it in the right way. And again, there, there's a lot to lose if we do a miscalculation. Now. Indeed, Mr. Oren. Um, the Israeli doctrine has always been uh, defense first, security first. Um, Israel uh, didn't really um, aspire for a peace deal with Syria or with Jordan if the terms were not right. You know, um, it, as um, uh, early as 1949, the uh, Syrian ruler at the time, Hosni Zaim, who came to power in a military coup and uh, was almost uh, as uh, quickly toppled by a military coup, uh, wanted to have peace with Israel in exchange for half of the Sea of Galilee. Now, so of course, Ben-Gurion said that the price was too high. Peace is fine, but not at that price. If annexing the uh, uh, Jordan Valley uh, will be to Israel's detriment security-wise, then it's a bad deal. The status quo right now vis-a-vis -vis Jordan uh, along the Jordan River and with military and intelligence cooperation between the countries is fine. Um, if it ain't broke, why fix it? Why annex it and then start a whole new conflict with both Jordan, which is one of the only two Arab countries to have peace with Israel, and with the moderate Palestinian regime of Mahmoud Abbas, who has no alternative but uh, to announce that uh, he is going to break the security coordination uh, with Israel. Things have been fine. Why change it only for the sake of domestic politics, both in Israel and in the United States? Professor Inbao? Well, I think that uh, it's quite clear that uh, annexation is signaling uh, a permanent presence for Israel in the future. This is what we've done in, uh, uh, in, uh, in Syria, in the Golan Heights, also in Jerusalem. Uh, so this is one reason why to annex this area. Uh, another reason is that uh, the status quo is not uh, uh, satisfactory because the Palestinian Authority is uh, gradually eroding uh, our uh, uh, control of all Area C and also particularly in uh, the Jordan Valley. Uh, another reason, uh, you know, uh, we uh, waited uh, for the Palestinians uh, for so many years. Oslo was in 93. We hoped to have a deal with them. They refused to come to the negotiating table for, uh, for the past four or five years. And I don't really, I don't believe they will ever agree to anything. They want uh, Jerusalem. They want 67 borders. They're uh, uh, 
demands are totally unrealistic. And the next thing you know is maybe uh, uh, an addition or uh, will influence their learning curve. Uh, unless they become more realistic, there will never be a deal between us and them. Therefore, uh, I think this is an important uh, uh, signal uh, to the Palestinians, to the whole world, that uh, time is not on their side. If uh, uh, time passes without them coming to the negotiating ta table, they'll have something to lose. Indeed. However, I, and this is something that I would like to ask you, Colonel Ben Shalom, when we're talking about uh, uh, the previous initiatives that were heard by different uh, U.S. administrations, uh, by the Europeans in cooperation with the international community, all of them have already designated that the final solution should be unequivocally a two-state solution, regardless of uh, a final agreement uh, negotiated on the basis of direct negotiations. And this has put both uh, the Palestinians, many of whom uh, have uh, for years said, no, we actually want a one-state solution. And on the other hand, uh, many Israelis who say, okay, we want a one-state solution. So uh, where is the situation uh, so problematic in which uh, a two-state solution is not uh, a viable solution for that matter after so many years of negotiations and discussions and, and uh, strategic thinking and, and many published papers. Uh, it seems like uh, this has already run its course and maybe an alternative should be uh, on the, the table, something that uh, not everybody is willing to accept. You're right, but I think there is no uh, wise solution. It's not like we have this solution, that solution, hey, we'll pick the smart one. There's no smart solution. A one-state solution, by the way, means catastrophe for Israel. That really means turning the whole place into one big state, equal vote for everyone, and actually the, the fundamental idea of the Jewish state is gone. So I don't think anybody really wants that. And remember that on the sidelines, fanatics on both sides, we have ideas that float up there that are not really viable, and that really mean, uh, you know, catastrophe for Israel. I think that the two-state solution, if you mean by that, going back to the 67 borders and having a Palestinian state and what a state means for around the world, you know, a, a sovereign state with a military and everything, also that is a catastrophe for Israel. So we all understand that we need some kind of uh, creative uh, solution. For a long time, we've been waiting for some secret deal, you know, that being cooked in Washington, uh, and then it came out, and it turned out that it was... By the way, they worked very hard and they were very creative, but it was a one side thing that doesn't grant the Palestinians a state, but a you know small entity that they can live in, surrounded in all directions, no military, and we control everything. So of course they would say no to that. So I don't think this discussion at all is dealing with a, with a reasonable solution that's on the table now, only managing the conflict. And as Amir Oren just said, we've been managing it not bad. By the way, from an Israeli perspective, the Palestinians always felt that they gain the more they wait. And of course, they were miserably wrong because the more they waited and the more they they took uh, aggressive or, or tactics of terror, of course, they, the more they lost. That means they're losing and losing ground and they feel it, which is why the more we push forward now unilaterally, they're going to up the heat. And we saw it just recently when President Abbas uh, ceased or declared that he's ceasing the, mm -hmm. the, the, co the cooperation with Israel. So... The only issue now is to play it right as far as the measures right now, not find a solution now. Indeed. Well, uh, we're drawing near to the end of the program, so I'd like to give each and every one of you the opportunity to have a closing analysis for the near future. Mr. Olin, we'll start with you. Uh, many Israeli experts uh, with deep defense background oppose annexation, and they point out that the costs, uh, even on the ground when you have a new uh, border, you have uh, to invest uh, billions of shekels and a lot of manpower to safeguard those um, fences and uh, the settlements if it is done uh, without the cooperation of the Palestinians. And uh, it seems as if many uh, Israeli newspaper readers or television watchers do not understand that the terms extending sovereignty and annexation are not synonymous one can extend one's sovereignty if there is a deal by which the Palestinians also annex parts of Israel's territory. So if Israelis dream only of net gains, 
it is not going to happen. Professor Inbao? I think that I would like to point out that uh, the extending the Israeli law uh, to the Jordan Valley and around Jerusalem is not a, a right-wing dream. It is rooted deeply in the labor right uh, uh, ideology. This is the plan that Alon initiated, that Rabin supported in his last speech. And uh, most important, it has a great uh, consensus among uh, the Israelis. We just published a poll that over 60% of the Israelis, including Arab citizens, support it. And among the Jews, it is 70% that are supporting uh, the uh, Israeli um, extending its law uh, over the uh, Jordan Valley. Mm -hmm. So a policy that has is backed by the Israeli consensus, that is backed by the United States, I think this is the optimum for Israel. Colonel Menchalon? I think we're going to see now uh, people that don't care about the Palestinians, don't care about the West Bank, but they will seem to care when we annex. So you're going to see the King of Jordan, and we already see it now, with bold statements of what he's going to do and what's going to happen when he doesn't care about the Jordan Valley, of course, and he likes the situation as it is. We're going to see Gulf states that want to push forward with countering their main enemy, which is Iran. They don't want to deal with the Palestinians, but when we force them to put that on the plate with annexation, of course, politically, they will have to counter that. So that's what we're going to see. People that don't care showing as if they care. Not to forget, of course, also the European capitals that have already announced uh, uh, the their plans of uh, uh, imposing some punitive measures against Israel if uh, such a move uh, is uh, indeed uh, in the near future, I'd like to thank Professor Inbal, Colonel Ben Shalom, and Mr. Owen for thank being you. here today and, and uh, being part of this panel from afar. And I'd like to thank our viewers as well. And we'll see you next time. You just watched TV7 Jerusalem Studio. We encourage you to pray for the challenges raised in today's program. If you were blessed by our production, please consider supporting TV7 Israel. The details of our respective bank accounts for donations from Europe and the United States appear on the screen. Your generosity allows us to continue to serve God's calling, to broadcast content that truly matters through TV7 Israel from Jerusalem.